Oxford Economics uh, podcasts. I'm Gabriel Stein, Director of Asset Management Services. With me is Ben May, Lead Eurozone Economists. Um, ben, you and I have today published uh, a uh, research briefing, uh, also known as the value of money, um, on negative interest rates as a central bank policy tool. And one thing we are saying is here we have something that, uh, if at all considered in the past, it was thought unthinkable or highly unlikely. And uh, we're saying, well, now it's there and it's going to remain part of the economic landscape of central banks' uh, armories in the future. Why is that? Well, I think the first thing is that by the four central banks, so those in the Eurozone, Sweden, Switzerland and Denmark, all actually adopting quite negative interest rates. I think it's really demonstrated to people that the, the, the potential concerns about such a policy have by and large been unfounded. And those concerns were? Well, I think probably the key ones were that, that, that simply it might not just work, that there will be a, a, a number of costs associated with it. For instance, it may well be that people just shift the cash and then effectively the, the negative deposit rate doesn't work. Um, I think, for instance, that has been proven not to be the case. By and large, there's been little evidence of that happening. So in, in essence, some of those negatives haven't materialised, whilst it's had some of the positive effects in terms of lowering short-term interest rates that have perhaps lower currencies. And therefore, perhaps it's just now being seen as something um, uh, much more conceivable uh, to adopt um, if, if interest rates uh, you know, can't be uh, a, a very low but positive in other words, if, if the world economy weakens further um, and we're still very close to zero, we might as well go negative. But one of the points you mentioned and one of the points that we found when we were doing this is that so far, and admittedly, um, uh, negative interest rates haven't been around for a very long time, but it's, it's very difficult to discern any impact beyond on exchange rates. There's clearly an exchange rate impact, but on, on things like uh, credit growth or broad money growth and activity and so on, we haven't really seen very much of that yet, have we? Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I guess I guess there's two issues. First of all, we're not quite sure what the counterfactual is. Clearly, we're in a time of, of large economic uncertainty. And so things like firms wishing to take out credit, you know, th 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 those sorts of things are, are clearly being affected by, by that uncertainty. So I think that's the first point to bear in mind. And then the second is that, for, that it's still a relatively new tool. Um, and it may well be the case that in a number of those economies, we yet to see the full impacts of negative interest rates on the credit channel. And so it may well be that perhaps this year is the year that we really find out um, the, the degree to which some of those um, aggregates respond to negative interest rates or not, as the case may be. Now, one of the things you mentioned as, as, as a concern with negative interest rates was that uh, banks would respond to negative interest rates by simply withdrawing their deposits from the central bank and holding physical cash. And, of course, uh, if you extend that to companies uh, and to households, that if they um, found that they were forced to pay negative interest rates, they pay the bank to keep the money in the deposit and so on, they would then withdraw it to cash. But, but of course, that doesn't really take into account uh, the substantial costs involved. Uh, one of the things we found is that uh, um, one, one cubic meter of space, you can store about 33 million pounds in 50 pound notes or $87 million in $100 notes and so on. And of course, that's a lot of money if you're an individual, but it's not terribly much money if you're a bank um, and even some companies. Um, so from, particularly from a banking perspective, moving into cash seemed a bit peculiar, but what about moving into other uh, assets, uh, shifting from, say, holding reserves with the central bank to buying equities or bonds or something? Well, I think one of the things that, that, that banks have preferred to do is, rather than store it as cash, is, is effectively try to 
um, lend out excess money at uh, uh, relatively short term uh, frequencies um, in the markets at less limited rates than the, the, the deposit rate. Um, clearly, it may well be that, that that's also had knock on effects um, at reducing uh, bond yields and perhaps even you know, those very low returns uh, on, on perhaps relatively risk free assets have also encouraged some people to, to look look beyond and, and invest in, in more risky assets like, like equities. Certainly, um, there was a good Wall Street Journal article uh, quite recently that was talking about the experience of Germany and, 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 and the fact that households which have traditionally um, tended to invest in very low risk um, assets like bank deposits and, and, and various low risk bonds are now starting to invest more in equities um, due to these very low returns. And clearly, it may well be that the negative interest rates um, exacerbate that kind of trend in, in, in the Eurozone. So they stimulate a further move into uh, assets that uh, not only hold their value but hopefully offer a bit of a return. Um, risk of asset price bubbles? For now at least I think that that's something that a lot of these central banks are clearly watching because it's, it's potentially one of the significant costs of, 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 of this that, that effectively they, they create much more problems for themselves further down the line. Um, it, it, Bubbles form. Um, certainly in the Eurozone, I don't think there's any obvious evidence of, of widespread bubbles. There may be maybe perhaps some bubbles emerging in one or two markets, potentially, but, but certainly more generally, I don't think that's the case. So I think, once again, that, that's perhaps a reason why, um, say, the ECB is, is likely to contemplate reducing the deposit rate further in the future. But that's the Eurozone. Now, if we look at Denmark and Sweden, who are actually the first uh, two countries to have negative interest rates, deposit rates in the case of Denmark's National Bank, policy rate in the case of, of the Riksbank Bank in Sweden, we are seeing um, housing booms, that clearly, and, and possibly housing bubbles. And Sweden is, uh, I think, of particular interest because the uh, Riksbank is moving into has moved into negative interest rates because they're failing to achieve their inflation targets. But on every other metric that you might want for Sweden, unemployment, uh, foreign trade, output growth, money and credit growth, the country is actually doing very well. Um, so there, and, and the Riksbank is concerned about um, household debt and and the housing market. How can they square this? Well, I think that's been a long concern for the Riks Bank, that, and, and that those concerns are predated by several years that the, 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 the movement to negative interest rates. So I think the first thing is it's perhaps a bit unfair to blame all of that on negative interest rates. Oh, of course. I think the second issue, certainly, um, I think some Swedish policymakers from the right have, have effectively said, well, look, this is our inflation target, that's what we've got to meet. Interest rates and other unconventional measures the only way we can do that. Um, if we feel that there's side effects emerging, then we're going to have to use other measures like macro prudential uh, style measures to, to tackle that, that side effect. So I think I suspect that that might well be the, the lesson that we that, that we see that um, if bubbles do emerge, that, that um, policymakers will also have to start thinking about other, other ways of um, uh, avoiding that. And one, uh, one of the things that um, we talk about in this piece, and, and this is actually a point that you made specifically, is that um, it may well be that the effectiveness of, of negative interest rates is diminishing as more and more central banks um, start to use this. Um, but as against that, um, I would I would reply well that that may actually mean that they go far deeper into negative territory to get more bang for the buck or the same bang for the buck. Yeah, well, I think really what a lot of central banks have been trying to do, either implicitly or explicitly, particularly in Europe, is is to try to bolster recoveries or, or boost inflation by um, allowing their exchange rates to appreciate. The real problem for, uh, I guess, the pioneers of negative interest rates um, in Europe has been that almost the success of their policy um, has, has encouraged the ECB to, to, to follow suit. And the fact that, um, it, that the Eurozone is the key trading partner for countries like 
Denmark, Sweden and Switzerland, this meant that the effectiveness of negative rates in those countries in, in terms of reducing it, um, the exchange rate has been um, diminished somewhat. Um, I think clearly what, uh, this perhaps goes back to your, your, your point about um, what the impact is on, on, on the domestic credit channel. Clearly, if, if those impacts are very limited, then um, in an environment where economies are effectively trying to competitively depreciate, it, it may well not uh, it may well not help in matters very much. Um, but I think what what we have learned so far from negative interest rates is is certainly that rates can probably go rather more negative than than many felt was likely. Um, without it seemingly having major negative implications in terms of hoarding cash um, and these kinds of things. And so I think the implications for that are that, that some of these, these central banks, if, if conditions were to, will, will experiment with, with, with um, pushing interest rates rather more negative. I agree. And uh, just to close off, we have talked mainly about Europe because the central banks that are currently using negative interest rates are European. Um, in the uh, United States, Stanley Fisher, who is the vice chair of uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, he's blown a little bit hot and cold. He said he doesn't <coughs> think it's a great idea, there could be problems, but also that the problems are transitional, but no use for the moment. And in Japan, Governor Kuroda of the Bank of Japan has made it clear that they are not going to use negative interest rates. Um, do we actually believe that they would, both these central banks will manage to stay positive forever, regardless of what happens? I think in the case of the US, um, the fact is that they've started to raise interest rates. So I, I guess the, the chances of them adopting negative rates are much more at risk. But I certainly feel that if, if we were to see some significant adverse shocks, um, and particularly if the, the, the European Central Banks were to, in, in that environment, to make their interest rates more negative. I think certainly in, in that environment, it might start to become a more attractive option. Um, I think really whether whether central banks you know, trying to loosen monetary policy further, um, go for negative interest rates or restarting QE, things like that, a lot will really depend on what, what they consider the uh, costs and benefits of those to be. So in the case of the euro, then perhaps there's some more obvious disadvantages associated with QE due to the political factors. It may be slightly different in the US, which perhaps means they might be a bit more keen to use, um, use QE. But I think really what we have seen is that, that perhaps it has been a more successful measure than, than people might have um, assumed, uh, I'm sorry, in terms of negative rates uh, a year or two ago. And, and I think that, that, that development means that it's likely that, that at least some central banks may, may, may follow suit at some point if, if economic conditions mean that it's warranted. I would agree entirely, and the more so if their object is, of course, to weaken the exchange rate, which no doubt we are likely to see in the Japanese case. Um, ben, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we will, of course, be back with other podcasts on topical issues in the future.